Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Sports. I am Ralph Lavella. And I'm Ron Sen. And here we are, it's spring, but it's snowing out. It still feels like winter. And we thought we'd talk a little bit about the tremendous success the winter sports teams had. Uh, courtesy of Jen Gentili, she updates us with all the success, both in team sports and individual events. First, why don't we talk a little bit about hockey. Hockey had a remarkable run into the playoffs with uh, three deep into the playoffs before losing to Burlington. Can't say enough about those kids. Yeah, we went to that semifinal game. That was, a, that was really a good hockey game. Burlington scored a late goal in the first period and a late goal in the second period. They ended up, I think, an empty net goal, too, to, go, right. to beat them 3-0. But it was a real good hockey game. And when you, you look at the skating, I was surprised. The skating was excellent, both teams. I mean, Burlington had a couple of kids who really put a lot of pressure on Melrose. But I thought Brown did a good job. I thought Mercer Brothers are tremendous, I believe. I think the, the key next year to Melrose, I mean, they have a lot of good skaters. I think that Zach Mercer, the sophomore, is going to be a superstar next year. His brother is just a powerful mm -hmm. player. He's, he's, he's a, to me, a superstar right now type player, strong skater. But Zach is going to be the type of player who's going to put a lot of pressure on the defense next year. Well, and Burlington was a tremendous team. I think they won the state championship right. in uh, Division I. And their goaltender was spectacular. He just had a remarkable glove hand. Melrose obviously have put in a new system with Coach Mirasolo. They did a great job. They try not to turn the puck over in their own end. They uh, were, had some chances, but the, you know, the shots just wouldn't go in for them. But really, you know, great effort. And you know, maybe they didn't have quite some of the you know, star scorers some of the art other teams had. But they were really effective. Yeah, Eric Mercer got to go, but they took it back. <clears throat> you know, um, the whistle blew. They had a couple of good opportunities. He had a couple of rockets from the point that the goalie made a great, great saves on. And then they had that late chance where um, they just deflected the puck a little to the left of the goal. But I thought it was an even match. Burlington beat Winchester, who looked great in the game before. And they beat him two to one, I believe, right. didn't they? I'm not sure the score. But, um, you know, I really enjoyed it. I, mean, I saw a number of games on TV. Well, and they have a very young team. They have a young goalie, Tyler Brown, uh, played really well. You know, so I think there's a lot to look forward to for Melrose Hockey. Yeah, the key's going to be they have some real good skaters. Again, Zach, to me, was the <coughs> best skater on the team. And if Zach gets to that point where he's constantly putting pressure on the defense against the good teams and these other players, there are a number of other young players that were good skaters. And then with Eric there, too, then you have the Raphael. Uh, it's going to be a real good team next yeah, year. I was talking with uh, Mike Raphael's father today, and he mentioned that you know, he has a pretty significant injury that he's working through, getting treatment for at uh, Children's Hospital. So hopefully he'll be back for full strength. And also the kids are very high over their chances in the football season this fall. Yeah, the football team's going to be <coughs> solid, led again by Eric Marissa and Raphael, middle linebacker and a right. running back. I mean, they're going to be real strong. And it was the final season for the Watertown Melrose girls hockey co-op. Melrose will embark on their uh, own team next season. They, they went one round into the postseason but got shut out. So, you know, a good learning experience for the girls hockey program. Now, obviously, they're going to have a young team. We understand there's a lot of uh, talented players in the middle school level, and we expect them to be moving into the forefront of uh, sports news. Yeah, I believe they have eight players <coughs> coming back from last year's team, so that'll be good. And like we, when we interviewed the Gorman sisters, right? Right. Um, they were high on the team. Um, they think they're going to have a lot of talent next year, and that'll be good. That'll be good for the girls. Right. Girls track had a, a wonderful season. I think they won the league, and they had some individual championship efforts. Uh, Olivia Downey, whom we coached in middle school basketball, repeated as the Division Three 600 state champion. So kudos to Olivia. And Bianca St. Fleur was the silver medalist in the 300, I don't know if it's yard or meter, 300 yard, I guess, or is it meter indoors? 300 meters indoors. And uh, Jen has some breaking news on her uh, future endeavors as well. So we don't want to uh, co-opt uh, her, right. her scoop. But Olivia Downey, you know, we, I, I'm, I want to see her run. I mean, we haven't seen her run. I mean, too bad it's, you know, they don't put it on TV. Um, they're, all their matches are away, or their meets are away. But I think with the new um, track up there at Pine Banks, hopefully they'll have their home right. meets will be there. So we'll see. Then girls gymnastics was the league champion undefeated, I think, for the fourth year in a row. 
So they're a, a dynasty of their own right. Um, Annalisa de Barry was the all-around league champion, and sh she was the state silver uh, medalist in the all-around. So fantastic job by Annalisa. Must make volleyball seem like an easy sport compared to uh, Cassidy's you know, on that team too. Right, Barbara. Cassidy, yeah. Barbara. They they have a lot of talented gymnasts, and you know, hats off to them for outstanding work. Um, when we talk a little bit about boys basketball, they had a great <coughs> season. Twenty and zero. They lost. They lost to Brighton. Was that in the semifinals? Right. It was the first uh, time in twenty five years that the team had gone uh, undefeated during the regular season. Middlesex League. To, quality basketball on the boys' side, and uh, you know, really outstanding effort. They had uh, great senior leadership from uh, Matt Sherlock and Sam Jean-Gilles. Uh, both of them were outstanding, and the league MVP was Francie Perot. Now, we don't know what his basketball future is, because it probably depends on what his soccer status is. As, you know, he's rumored to be in line for a potential uh, soccer scholarship to either Duke or Virginia. Right, we saw him as a remember we saw him as a freshman. We said he's going. This kid's going to be a superstar. I mean, he <clears throat> he has a well. He's got a better future in soccer, and he's one of the top players in the country, I believe. And in basketball, he's one of the top players around in Mass. He has another year left, and that's going to be a key. If he comes back next year, they're going to have another strong team. But once again, they lose to Brighton. You know, well, same way. With it, James it, is the point guard, right? Is it right. James? James was the Gatorade Player of the Year in Massachusetts. He's, he's just a terrific player. Uh, for, actually, uh, Perot held him down pretty well when he played him man-to-man. Uh, -man. But, you know, even holding him down is, means he probably had 20 points and 8 assists. And, you know, Melrose played great basketball. They, they didn't back down. They, they fell behind 10 nothing and had to take a quick timeout. Came back to go ahead uh, in the second half. But uh, Brighton's a great team. So there's nothing to take away from... Uh, Melrose's effort, Brighton's the state champion. Yeah, same thing happened last year. They lost a tough game. Well, that right. last year, Perot got in foul trouble. He was covering right. James right out the beginning. Right. They had to take him off James, you and know, then James went crazy. Uh, Matt Sherlock had five threes in the game. I think he had 21, 22 points. He was outstanding, had some block shots, uh, you know, just played tough at both ends of the floor. And uh, you, you can't say enough about the team. They really didn't do anything wrong. You know, every team. Uh, wishes they shot better at some, some point in the game, and Brighton outshot them from the free throw line. That probably was the difference in a close game, but that happens. It was just one of those things where Brighton was able to make a couple more plays than Melrose. Well, you went to the game, right? Right. How did it look? Did it look like last year where James was breaking down the team in the lane and then kicking it out for the wide open threes? Well, um, they did some of that. James created a lot of his own offense. Brighton is extremely well coached, just as Melrose is, and they, they have outstanding spacing. Um, Chuck Daly, former coach of the Pistons, has a saying that offense is spacing and spacing is offense. And Brighton, they space the, team, the floor just like a college team or a professional team. They, they're the best I've seen any high school team in spacing the floor, which with no knock on any other team. Just they're, they're an exceptional team. And I had gotten a text from uh, Danny Ventura from the Herald before that uh, said that the Brighton coach had told him that they had just had their two best practices of the year before the Melrose game. So they came in playing a really outstanding ball. They kept it going. Melrose did everything they could do. It just They had a, a three-pointer by Sam that just went off uh, at the buzzer and just missed. Well, it was a tie game with a minute to go, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, two minutes to go, something like that. Did Brighton press like they did last year and then fall into his own? Yeah, Mel Melrose pretty much handled the pressure early on. They had, you know, a few few shots that might have gone down but didn't. But that's that's basketball. Brighton came out, made their first four shots, went up 10-0, um, you know, and really shot the lights out. Um, but uh, James and Simpson, they were just outstanding players. And you know, you you, you have to give credit to the other team too. Melrose was a out had an outstanding season. Brighton just had a little bit more. The only thing I didn't like, I read in the paper that um, when they lost the game, we lost to the best team in the state. You know, I mean, usually you don't say stuff like that when you lose a tough, that's the way I am. 
You know, you lose a tough game by two or three points. Well, the, Ralph's approach is if we were playing the Celtics, he'd be disappointed that we lost because he said, well, we could play better than this. But I, I remember them from last year, and I thought they should have done a couple of things to beat that they, they could have beaten Brighton. They had as, as much talent or more. James, they just let they, James dominate the game. I didn't see it, but the way it looks like, James dominated the game. And when they had a pinch in, Simpson was wide open for threes. Is that the same thing that yeah, happened? Yeah, it's pretty much. Sim, you know, Simpson is, is a really talented player, too. So they, you have to respect what James does when, you know, and you have to sag off when, when he penetrates to the basket. But, but he heard him more from the outside than anything else. You know, he, he can take that one or two dribbles into a, a quick mid-range jumper. And, you know, they say the mid-range game is gone, but he's got an excellent mid-range game. And he's only, he and Simpson are both only juniors. You know, the difference might have been that um, Brighton plays a little tougher schedule than Melrose. That might have been a difference. It, it could know, be. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it, you, you can always make up a reason why the outcome could have been different or should have been different. I thought the game was officiated pretty well. Great atmosphere. There was a full house over at uh, Woburn. Woburn's got their DJ playing music in between. Uh, Driving everybody nuts. Yeah, you know, but uh, it was really a, a great high school basketball game. It's, I mean, it's a little disappointing for Melrose that they didn't come out on top, but it wasn't because they, they did anything wrong or they didn't give a great effort, because they absolutely did. The, the coaching was excellent. They had a great team. Somebody's got to win, somebody's got to lose when you have two outstanding teams playing. You know, I saw one game, we saw the game against Wilmington. They looked unbelievable. <clears throat> they looked so talented. And then I saw off and on I, some of those games on TV, but you didn't hear any sound, so you didn't even, half the time you didn't even know who they were playing. Right, and we, and we saw them play against uh, Arlington in the postseason. Yeah. They, they did it, you know, they really shut down Arlington. They, Melrose puts great pressure on the ball. The, there's two philosophies in general about how you play defense especially. It's whether, and, and there's not one that's right and one that's wrong. It's just whether you try to, create some confusion or different looks for teams by changing defenses and showing them things they're not used to, which is what Melrose likes to do, and, and I like that approach. And the other approach is just we do what we do best. We do that, you know, for 40 minutes. That, that's the old Georgetown approach with full-court man-to-man pressure or Arkansas when Nolan Rich Richardson was there or UCLA when they ran their three-quarter court 2-2-1 two, two, trap. You just you just do what you do, and everybody else has to execute better than you do. Hey, what were, what were they, 22 and 0 when they lost? Right. I mean, you know, they had a fantastic season. You couldn't ask for more. That was one of the, I think, out of all the years I've been watching Merrill's basketball, definitely the most talent, this yeah. team here. I mean, they were just loaded. Even some of those hmm. freshmen were good players. Right. They, they, they have a bright future, and Perot's going to be the key, though. I mean, it's a bright future if Perot plays. Well, it's, you know, they, they're, not going to have a lot of size if, right. if uh, they don't find some somewhere. You know, and right. you know, it might be uh, the Declaration of Independence about all men being created equal, but that's not the way it is on the basketball no. court. Size matters. No. And how about Kayla Weiland? Kayla Weiland was named uh, MVP of the Freedom Division uh, of the Middlesex League, and um, Kayla had a, an absolutely terrific season. Uh, she was all league player as well. I think she averaged around 14 points, more than eight rebounds, and about three blocks a, a game, and just had a wonderful uh, campaign. Right, and that's in, she beat out players like Coppola, right? Coppola's in the right. That team, um, Watertown's in the Freedom Division. Yep. Those girls from Wilmington, mm -hmm. that's good. Yeah. So, you know, and the team struggled a little bit. They uh, finished six and 14. You know, third. A lot of injuries, a lot of sickness in that team. Yeah, it's you know, it just wasn't uh, meant to be. I mean, no, Brooke Bell was playing some great basketball. She either got sick or hurt her f foot, and, you know, she couldn't. When she came back, she was still hurting a little. And then she went out sick again. You know, Kayla was sick there for a while. And Sydney Doherty was and she had a leg injury. Sprained her ankle. Right. So, you know, I think a lot of things have to go right for, for teams to be uh, as successful as they can. They, they struggled in games close and late. I think they finished... Uh, one in five in games that were decided by four points or less. Well, look at Watertown. Would they lose to Pentecost in the semifinals? Right. In Merrill's, the first three periods of Watertown, it was a great game until Merrill's got in a little foul trouble, but well, that was a the, great game. And the other, there's some realignment going on in uh, the MIAA. Pentucket is moving up into Division two, two from Division three, so they'll, they'll probably 
be one of the name brand teams in the future. Well, they'll, uh, be, the, they'll be the favorites next year. One would think. McNamara's coming back to point guard. And Redding is moving to Division One along with uh, North Andover. So, uh, and then the word is in the South that Archbishop Williams is going from Division Three to Division One. I guess they must have had an outstanding recruiting year. Re well, they had here. a 6'3 center, right? Well, they had a 6'4, 6'2, 6'1 front line. You know, and, and that's a whole... Sorry, Redding beat them, right, Ron? Red, the Red, Redding beat them. Uh, Redding lost in uh, the garden Medfield. to Medfield, the ultimate state champions. Now, I didn't see the game, so I, I, you know, I can just report the news. Redding lost 59-51 in overtime. And the number of free throws taken in the game was Medfield 42, Reading 8. Wow. So that's probably the biggest disparity in free throws that I've ever heard With of. With Haley on Reading, too. Right. So that's amazing. Now, apparently, Reading was ahead by uh, one with a fraction of a second to go. A girl took a desperation three, and they called a foul on Healy at the end. Now, God knows whether it was a foul or not, but the girl made one out of three to, to send the game into overtime, and then Medfield won in overtime. So another great year for Redding. The, the word is that Kim Penny is uh, stepping down as Redding coach. I wonder why she's stepping down, Ron. Well, she, you know, she probably wants to spend more time with her family. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, you know. Well, you always, I, you I know. wonder that the talent is now dry over there in Redding and... Um, well, this is a know, good time to retire. Well, she, you know, she did a great job. She won a state championship and had a second appearance in the Garden. And, you know, to our friends and colleagues in in Reading, uh, you know, we'll she's be had some unbelievable talent over there. Probably isn't. Well, well Merrill's number one over the last ten years, and then Reading. Well, I mean, she's had powerhouses all the way through. They've had Shoemaker. They had Jackie Lyons. They had. Uh, the other lions. The other, the other lions. Was it Jennifer Lyons? I don't know. The other lions, Mary Sylvia. So, so they, they've had a lot of outstanding players there. Uh, also, uh, it would be remiss of us not to report that uh, um, Matt Finikos is a Division Three champion, uh, state champion in wrestling, and Ryan Stanton got a silver medal. So not only are the sports that are a little bit higher profile having success, but some a lot of the other sports did exceptionally well uh, as as well this season. It's been a, it's been a great winter. I mean, run and, and the best is yet to come because with these new fields and the, the beautiful gym they have and, and the new schools, I mean, you're going to see. I mean, I think sports in Maryland is going to keep going at a high rate. I mean, it's just everybody's really sky high. More kids are staying now in the in Melrose. And I think, you know, in the future really looks bright. Well, the future is so bright, we've got to wear shades. We'll be right back. On and off the court, Visionary Basketball Group delivers programs that empower players with skills for athletic and personal success. Our players undergo learning experiences that position them for positive lifelong achievement on and off the court. Hello, my name is Anthony Taylor, founder of Visionary Basketball Group, VBG. It's a year-round basketball player development organization ranging from preschool to college and professional level, girls and boys. We cater to all skill levels, starting from beginner, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. One of the biggest things that we have is our coaching staff, who do a phenomenal job at mentoring the players on a regular basis with the training, the teaching, and the knowledge. We operate seven days a week. We offer over 30 sessions. It was considered one of the top comprehensive basketball player development organizations in New England. And another key aspect that we do is that we have kids coming from all different areas, urban, suburban communities, uniting as one. And that's what makes VBG a phenomenal uh, organization that helps kids gain confidence, leadership, discipline, self-esteem. And if you have a chance, come down and see what we do at Visionary Basketball Group. VBG player athletes are rising stars in elementary, middle school, high school, and college basketball. We apply the same approach to training with every participant at VBG and produce players who are prepared for maximum performance. 
Visionary Basketball not only provides programs for individuals, we can also come to your town, school, or any institution to customize a structured program for your team or basketball organization. For more information, please log on to our website, www.visionarybasketball.com, or drop into our Athletic Performance Center at 152 Tremont Street, Melrose, Mass. BBG, complete your vision. Welcome back. Spring is here, that means baseball. In New York, that means injuries. As first they had A-Rod, then it was Teixeira, now it's Jeter. And Grandison too. Oh, and Grandison. So a lot of young <laughs> players are going to get an opportunity in New York, and the star of the team right now must be Kevin Euclid. Yeah, Euclid has three home runs in the spring. They're getting pretty good pitching from so many young pitches, so who knows, you know? I mean, with Sabathia and, some, you know, Pettit is back. Hopefully, um, what's his name, Corona has a good year. Well, they did a survey of Major League Baseball players and, and found all kinds of uh, unexpected findings. First, uh, the, among, I think, over 100 players in an anonymous survey, uh, Toronto was picked to win the division. They were always picked to go high. Yeah, we'll see. They, they made that big trade with Florida, and we'll, we'll see what that turns into. It's probably why they got rid of Farrell, who's the Red Sox manager now, to give themselves a better chance to win. I'll tell you, Ron, they may not, they may, every team in that division, none of them may get to 90 wins when you look at it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a, pretty balanced. You know, I I'm, I'm kind of have this enduring love for Tampa just because they have great pitching. Uh, you know, I don't like Madden, though. No. Well, I, he I gets know. too much praise, and he's in, got the best pitching in baseball the last five years. I know. It was in Nick Cafardo's article in the Globe last weekend. He, he ranked Bruce Boshi first of San Francisco because uh, they've won two World Series out of three, and nobody can name five players on their team probably. And then they had Madden picked second. And, you know, it's, yeah, if you have great pitching, it's going to be a lot easier to just throw somebody out there. And how, how hard is it to coach when you have pitching like that? They go seven, eight innings of starting pitches, and then you have to, you go to your bullpen. I mean, when you have to go to your bullpen. Right. With Price in there, sometimes you don't have to go to your bullpen. Right, so, so I, I still think Tampa's going to be pretty good, but the Red Sox and Yankees are going to have to scramble th this season. The Yankees and the Red Sox will have good pitching. The Red Sox have good pitching. I, I think they're going to they're gonna bounce back. They have a good bullpen. An another survey question was, what percentage of players own guns? Now, no, it doesn't matter if they own guns, they own guns. Well, the answer is that 46% of major league players said they owned guns. Now, Baseball players? Yeah. And they, said, they asked them, what is the average number of guns that you own? How many guns do you think the average player owns who owns a gun? Two? Four. So, and they asked players, why do you own a gun? He said, well, you put my salary in the paper and it's $8 million a year. You think I'm not going to have a gun to protect my family? So, you know, again, it's no social commentary. It's just that's how it is. And then they asked players, how many of you know a player in Major League Baseball who's gay? So what percentage of players do you think said, I know somebody who's gay who's a professional baseball player? Percentage of players? Well, what percentage of players Pro said they knew somebody who was gay? Probably 1%. Yeah, the answer was 5 So it was pretty low. Now, again, that's you know, no social commentary. You know, it's, it's what you do between the lines that counts. And the 5% that said they do? probably have best friends that are because no one else is going to tell them. Well, right. And they, and they, one player said, you know, this is an anonymous survey and I'm not talking about what team they're on or anything else. So, you know, and it doesn't matter. It's, it's, you know, we're in the... What percentage of people are gay? Usually it's around 8%. 8% of gay? Right. And, you know, there's some interesting research, to go off the track, where they've taken male sweat and done... Uh, brain imaging where they can look at functional scans to see what part of the brain lights up. And if you give uh, normal subjects, uh, straight males, gay males, and straight women, a chance to s smell this male sweat, the brain enhancement or area that lights up is the same in gay men and straight women when exposed to male sweat. So that's not a choice you make. That's you. How your brain responds to breathing in sweat. Now, whatever. So, 
Um, again, not a social commentary. That's just interesting research from the world of medicine. You cannot get that on ESPN. Anyway. And I'm not going to get deeper into it either. As for the Red Sox, you know, we have redemption is forever. And, and the Sox. Should Bradley be on the team when they go on April 1st against the Yankees? If he's one of the 25 best players and, one, and is going to play every day because of need or injury, he should be on the opening day roster. How do you know roster. if he's one of the best 25? How do you know? He, because if he... If You're he, a manager of the Red Sox. How do you know he's one of the best top 25 players? Yeah. Well, really top, one of the top 14. Well, take the pitches out. I know the, that's that's a great the question. The, the age-old question in baseball is: Do you make decisions with your eyes or do you use statistics? Well, everybody said he's an absolutely phenomenal outfielder. He was voted the number one minor league outfielder defensively, just like Iglesias was voted the number one defensive infielder. Now Iglesias can't hit, and so far he's hit 444 in spring training. They asked Gomes today, so they've only been on the field with him like an inning all spring, so I've never seen him play. Well, Gomes doesn't want him to make the team. Well, right. Gomes wants to play he, left. He wants to play full time. Well, the argument I would make, if Bradley's your best center fielder, because not only can he track down flies like nobody else, he also can throw the ball to the infield, which well, Ellsbury he reads. can't. He reads the play real quick. Right. And He's Ellsbury you know, has a terrible arm, so Ellsbury should be the one playing left, not not well, you Bradley. know, the last time they moved Ellsbury to left field. Yeah, he ran into Beltre. <laughs> but, you know. But you, you believe Bradley should be starting Well, if over the next, field, if uh, the next couple of weeks he continues to hit deep into spring training against quality major league pitching who was out there for four to six innings, then I think, well, you know, how's he going to get better? He's going to get better playing in triple A? I mean, you know, so... The, the other, for those who don't know, the argument is if you don't bring him up till after April 12th, then this year doesn't count towards service time, so he couldn't be a free agent till 2019 instead of 2018. Well, for the Red Sox, those of us who've been in the Sahara Desert without a glass of water, sometimes if a glass of water comes around, you're really not worried that it's going to be empty in 2019 instead of 2018. Well, here's what it comes down to. I've been thinking about this. And I feel he should be coming up, too. A lot of people think that he should stay down in the minors because of, you know, the length of service and all that and his contract and when they have to pay him, when he becomes a free agent, when he can go to arbitration. But I think the Red Sox will be thinking, hey, if we bring him up, we're going to sell more tickets. People are going to want to see him play. There's, there's so little excitement. Right. I mean, I can barely watch an in, more than an inning of spring training baseball, because, you know, probably because we're used to watching basketball where something is always happening, whereas in baseball you can, you know, paint well, or I'm, do anything else. Well, me as a Yankee fan, I am so upset. With, I told you, in all the years I've been, I've been watching, I've been a Yankee fan since I was five years old. I mean, I've seen some great teams, some bad teams. These, this team here, they're just a bunch of chokers. Every, just about every player. Jeter. Is an exception. I mean, he's older now. He's not as good as he used to be. But everybody else, I mean, it just goes right down the line. Cano, who you love, you know, I tell you, he hits a three-run homer when they're up, when they're down by two and they need a three-run homer, you never see it. To share it, the same thing in the big games. But I'm so down on that team. I'd rather see the young players play as a fan. Well, look, look at the Red Sox. You, you have, I'm presuming you're going to have Salta Lamaki as the primary catcher with the uh, uh, What's his face? Who's the backup now? Oh, the new guy, the guy they got? I forget that. Ross. Yeah. Ross David yeah. Ross. Who, who's probably a serviceable backup, but there's no excitement there. First base, Napoli. I like him. Yeah, Napoli's going to be okay. He's going to be a big power here. You one. know, Pedroia's Pedroia. Nobody, who doesn't like Pedroia? Shortstop, Stephen Drew. He's turned into J.D. Drew. I don't even know. Yeah, who are they going to start? Well, it's going to be Iglesias right now. Stephen you know, Drew. They got to hope he hits a little. Stephen Drew had a concussion, and he doesn't seem to be able to come back. Now it's no knock on the guy because he got a concussion. It's just bad luck for him. But Ron, you look at that lineup, though. I mean, you you look at the lineup. Again, as a Yankee fan looking at the Red Sox, you got Ellsbury leading off. Probably Pedroia if they Bradley plays. You have Ellsbury, Pedroia, Bradley. One, two, three. All Pedroia's quick now. He's quick. All three of them are very quick, very good defensively. I know you don't like Ellsbury, but I think Ellsbury tracks the ball pretty good. And then you got Middlebrooks, 
you know, probably batting fourth or fifth. You know, and they got some, Napoli. Napoli. I mean, I mean, they got a good, it all comes down. Yeah. Look at San Francisco Giants. They went yeah. two out of three with the pitch in and timely hitting. Right. And, you know, and there are years where teams and players just play better. You know, in the last two years, that hasn't been the Red Sox, but. They do know, have a better future than the Yankees, though. Unless some of these young pitchers for the Yankees develop. You know, right. they have a lot of talent. But. Well, my prediction for the year, the Red Sox player who will underperform the most, the player who, who, who will underachieve will be Shane Victorino, the king of spam. Did you see that? Yeah, I thought you were going to say Ellsbury. No, I think Ellsbury will have an okay year. I, you know, I, I think that Ellsbury has talent. He had injuries last year. You know, he has a chance. He, you know, we'll see how the pressure of playing for a big contract affects him. I just see as the year goes on, Ellsbury's going to get injured, and you're going to see Bradley in center field. You know, I just see that, and that's going to be, and then Ellsbury's going to leave next year. And, well, the and strength of the team fielder. right now appears to be the bullpen, you know, which... You know, Starters could be strong, though, Ryan. Well, you know, Lester couldn't pitch any worse than he did last year. I don't know about him. I thought he was going to be a good pitcher, but Lester is going to buck holds. You know, they got to hope Lackey... Lackey and Dempster. To me, Dempster's a... You know, ERA five, 500 they, pitcher. They could have a good pitching staff. I mean, if they, you know, yeah, fifth. You know, there's a lot well, of Well, I think that, you know, the, the guy that we're going to see if, if somebody struggles is Alan Webster, down who came over in the Dodger trade. He pitched, I think, 14 innings in spring training and had an ERA of under two and was just, he's got that hard Kevin Brown type sinker that, and he can throw up to 97. Now well, we'll see if his arm holds up. Why is everybody down on Buckholtz, though? I thought Buckholtz had a pretty good year last yeah, he year. Was good he had last some year. quality starts. He's looking great this spring. Well, he was sick because of he had esophageal problems from Toradol. Toradol is a powerful anti-inflammatory that can cause stomach irritation, and apparently a lot of players take it before they pitch to try to uh, keep the inflammation and swelling pain down. I mean, anybody who's played a lot of sports and knows that you do anything repetitively, you're going to hurt. And by the I'm sure that at this point in the NBA season, nobody's 100%. Everybody's hurting. But I think the Red Sox, they're going to be a fun team to watch this year. I just have that feeling, especially if Bradley make plays and he's steady in that lineup. I mean, just look at the team there. They don't have any idiots, especially in that lineup. They have all players that are going to work hard, led by Pedroia. Middlebrook stays healthy. Napoli stays healthy. You know, if he can give them, you know, 500 at-bats, you know he's going to hit 30 home runs. Yeah, one of the points in... Jay Billis's new book uh, called Toughness is that players in sports now grow up, they have their own coach, they're in AAU or there's some kind of specialized training as youngsters. So their view of the role, of the, on their role on the team is subservient to what they can do for themselves. Now, it is what it is, you know, and especially in, a sport, in sports where players are getting highly compensated. So... I mean, when you're, when you're coaching younger players, high school players, or if you're a college player, you can, you're the coach, you're the ruler, you're the, you know, the absolute. You know, it's, as Bobby Knight would say, it's, I'm Sinatra, it's my way. And, um, you know, but it's tough when you get into professionals because the, the players are predominantly concerned about how their performance affects their compensation. And then how do you coach them? I mean, you, what are you really coaching them? Are you teaching them how to hit and pro ball? You're teaching them how to catch a ground ball or run right. down a fly ball. I mean, a guy like Iglesias, if they could, if they could teach him how to bunt, so he could get a bunt hit every couple of weeks. You know, the difference between hitting 250 and 300 is one hit a week. So if if you can get a bunt down every other week, you can raise your average 25 points, and you make it on the team instead of being a bench player. Well, that's where Valentine screwed up last year in spring training. He was, he thought these players wanted to learn how to play baseball. He's over there teaching them how to catch a ground ball, how to do cutoffs, how to swing a bat. They're looking at him and say, what are you, an idiot? Oh, right. <laughs> That's right. Well, conversely, fundamentals in sports, you know, we believe strongly, no matter what level of play you're at, that fundamentals are everything. You, whatever play you run doesn't matter if you can't execute it. Yeah, but a lot of these pros didn't get there because of fundamentals. They got there because they're just so much They got there because of talent, the, yeah, right. Physically better. I mean, they can, you know, whether it's baseball, hitting a baseball, or pitching and throwing a ball 95 miles an hour, you know, I mean, you got to work on your form a little, but if you have a, an arm that can throw the ball 95 and you can throw a slider. Well, and some of them got there because they used PEDs 
to exaggerate their in natural ba skills. Right. In basketball, you know, you think LeBron James got there from coaching? Look, look at him. The guy's no. a freak out there. And same thing with Kobe. Right. No, it's, there's no question that you have to have great talent to play. But look at a guy like Pierce. He's not fast. He can't jump. The guy's amazing. What do you? Well, fundamentals used, with him, right, definitely. Right. Right. He's got he's got a million different ways to score. You know, he's really shifty and sly. But you know, I was reading something from Doc Rivers. He says, you know, when I coached against Pierce, I didn't think he was that good. You know, when I was with Orlando, because he wasn't quick. He was quick. What are these people talking about? Remember when he was young, he used to take the ball to the hoop, stay in the air, and slam the ball, finish with either hand. He was almost like Colby, but a smaller version of Colby. Well, and he's, still, he's not fast, but he's still powerful. He's he was, got a big upper body. He was so. averaging 25, 26 points a game, playing with Walker. Well, you know, he scored almost 24,000 points in his career. It's not like the guy didn't do something. So, right. you know, he, he's a terrific player. We'll be right back. Athletic Evolution, it starts with a purpose and ends with your success. Visit our website or drop into our training facility at 78B Olympia Avenue, Woburn, Mass. Athletic Evolution, giving you the edge. Good evening. So, we're a little bit mad with Bill Belichick this week, are we? We're not too big of a fan. And I am not either because I am mad about the Wes Welker fiasco. But, in the spirit of George Collin, I will give you the two sides of Patriots head coach Bill Belichick. Bill Belichick is a genius. Bill Belichick is the Antichrist. Which is it? There's no mistake. He's ruthless. He doesn't care what you think. He doesn't care what I think. He probably doesn't even care what Bob Kraft thinks. He probably said at some point, Bob, you sit in your luxury box, you count your money, and I'm going to run the team. And I'll count my money. He doesn't care. But anyway, in keeping with that, here they are. Opposing views, two, in the spirit of the movie Animal House. Welker was franchised last year, and he made a ton of money. But he earned every penny. We cannot pay a slot receiver that kind of money. He's not just any slot receiver. He caught 665 plus passes since 2007. Look at the punishment he takes over the middle and he always got up for more. The Pats offered him fair market value. Denver's offer was only slightly above it. Bite your tongue, my little red adversary. The Patriots insulted their best playmaker with a substandard contract offer that was loaded with unrealistic, unreachable incentives. They couldn't even go up a few bucks to keep him. But enough of that. You want to talk success? Let's just look to the past. I always like to look to the past so that we can talk about the present so that I can make my point. There were plenty of Hall of Fame, tremendous coaches, and I'll give you three of them. Vince Lombardi, Bill Walsh, and Joe Gibbs. Three tremendously successful coaches that won countless championships. And they knew when to get out at the right time. I'll give you two that I'm not going to say they didn't. But, you know, the truth of the matter, Tom Landry, one of the great coaches of all time, one of the great offensive slide rule mind of Tom Landry, 
okay? You look at the success that team had, he took them to five Super Bowls over a nine-year period. Not too bad. But then he hung around for ten more years and ended up getting fired because, well, they didn't win. Chuck Knoll, we all know, the great Pittsburgh Steelers of the 70s, they won four in six years, okay? But what happened? Chuck Knoll went a long time after that, dozen more years without winning anything, okay? Now, let's look at Bill Belichick. Let's take a look at what he's done by comparison. We all know that he's gone a little bit of a while, you know, there's been a drought that we talk about. Oh, the drought. Well, he hasn't won anything. Very true. But what's he done since the drought began? Okay, 2004, we won a Super Bowl. Since then, we have been to two Super Bowls. And one of them, we came a West Welk, a drop away from possibly winning it. But I digress. Two other seasons, we went to the AFC Championship game. Okay, one season... Brady was lost in the first game, and the other, well, you know what? What are you going to do? You can't win them all. But I'll tell you, unlike Landry and Noel, two of the great coaches of all time, Belichick not only belongs up there next to them, look at what we've done in the last decade, okay? Now we have to take a serious look at why we want to criticize Belichick. He let go of a great player in Welker. He let go of a fan favorite. Bad combination right there. Don't let go of fan favorites that produce. In truth, if the Pats wanted them, they could have threw more money out to them. Why they didn't, I don't know. Okay? Bob Kraft ought to just shut up and not try and justify anything because if they wanted to keep them, they would have kept them. And that's it. But do we want to go back to the Dust Bowl days of that cement crap hole called Schaefer Stadium when the Patriots were routinely either good enough to almost get it done and couldn't or just plain stunk. No, we don't want to go back to those days. So you know what? Let's be thankful for what we have right now. We still have possibly the greatest coach of the last 25 years right here coaching for us. We may not like his moves, we may openly question them, and once again, I do not like the Welker move. When it comes to Bill Belichick, he has earned the right for us to give him his due. In Bill Belichick, we trust, for better or for worse. Welcome back. Now, a lot of you are wondering who killed JFK. That's really nothing. What did the Patriots offer Wes Welker? Did they say, Tell us what you want. Or they say, we already signed Danny, Danny Amendola. Have a nice day. You think Lou was right when he was talking about Welka? Maybe. I mean, I don't know. I don't think we'll ever know the story. You know, but... Well, here's, here's what it comes down to. They offer... Just think of this. They offer Welka $5 million for the next two years. $5 million a year. Plus incentives. The guy has caught over 100 passes four, four out of five years, or whatever it is. He's leading the league, I believe, in receptions over that time. Now they want to give him, give him $5 million plus incentives? I mean, that's an insult to me. Well, he here's my theory. At, later in the season, Welker took some really big hits. You know, and you remember in the game against Baltimore, he, got, he, he really got crushed. And then the next one they threw right to him. He probably was seeing the little birdies floating around his head. I'm just thinking, this guy's taking too many hits. His time is getting short. He gets another couple of big hits in the head, and that's it. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. You, you know, I heard one person talking about, well, you, you know, what does this guy want? He dropped the two most important passes in his life in, in one Super Bowl, and then last year against Baltimore. Cost him a Super Bowl, probably. Well, he led the league in receptions, I think, and he led the league in drop passes. Now you get the ball thrown to you a lot, and, and a lot of those passes are, are short passes. He doesn't have a lot of time to react. But you know, yeah. it was, I couldn't believe that the best offer he got was six million a year, and the second year is not even guaranteed over well, in Denver. You know, the other—that's amazing. The, the other thing that people have to remember: Austin Collies. Now, people say Manning is great; he doesn't leave the players out. Austin Collies got, you know, 
so many concussions and it basically Manning can lay the ball in there but Manning's not always worried about what's happening to the receivers either I, you know I, plus the timing you know on Ikea you know Welk is great at you know those short passes one of those patterns but the time has got to be there. He's not going to have the time in that him and Brady had. You know, as good as Manning is, Manning still has two good receivers besides him that he's going to be looking for. I heard that um, Belichick, the one thing he didn't like about this whole Welker-Brady thing is that Brady looked to Welker too much. And well, they so, already have guys, Hernandez and Gronkowski, again, and every, in the NFL, every player's health is suspect because they're always getting whacked. Then he's got those running backs, too, that he throws. Vereen, right, and, and Washington now. They made a decision to let Woodhead go, which, you know, you, you can't keep everybody. And, uh, you know, Woodhead had a couple of really solid years for them, and now he's getting paid in San Diego. And but, but the big issue for the Patriots hasn't been scoring enough points. The issue has been not being able to keep the other team from scoring enough points. Right. I mean, that's... I you mean, know, the, the big discussion now is not quarterback rating, it's defensive passer rating. And... I don't care whether you get better secondary, whether you get better linebackers or a better pass rush, you've got to do something to slow. I mean, they had no rush on Flacco. Flacco, now Flacco's got a separate issue, a lot of defections off Baltimore. Right. Oh, well, yeah, and they're going to be in tough shape. I can't believe they gave him all that money. That's ridiculous. He said he wasn't even looking for it, and they gave it to him. Well, if you get so much money that you're taking away from other parts of the team, then you end up ending up short. But I can't figure out Belichick, though. Ron, he is, he is, he's, I mean, they've had a great history since 2001, and Brady's been with the team since then. How does he end up with a defense like this? I mean, how does he end up with it? I mean, you got a guy like Spikes, who everybody loves, because, you know, when he hits, you feel it. He's great against the run. He's terrible against the pass run. Absolutely, he shouldn't be in there. Like we talked about Fletcher, hopefully Fletcher comes back healthy, and they move Fletcher in there in passing situations. Well, and the question is whether this... Andre Wilson, whether he's going to be more of a, you know, middle linebacker, fifth defensive back to, to shut down the middle of the field. You know, if you watch some of the YouTube videos of this guy, he puts some nasty hits on people. He's yeah. big. But, Ron, it's this simple on defense. If you don't have linemen up the middle that can get near the quarterback, forget about it. I don't care who you have on the outside, Ninkovich, Jones, whoever you get. It doesn't matter because they're getting eight ta sacks a year. What is that? That's 16 sacks between the two of them in 16 games, and they're rushing from the outside. So every other time they don't get to the quarterback, they're not in the quarterback's face. Well, what do you think the issues, the issues are? You need big linemen in the middle that can right. penetrate, not, not Will Falk. And I think they're going to draft a lineman in the first round. They, they've, I don't think they've ever drafted a receiver in the first round. Um, not during – you know, they've had, no, they haven't no. really had a lot of luck drafting receivers. Second, a lot in the second Except now. Branch. Um, you know, but and they let Louie go, so that's going to hurt him, too. Well, they say, there's, yeah, they say there's a lot of receivers out there. So, but know, how we'll do you let Louie go? Even though, you know, he's a knucklehead in a way, he caught 70-something passes. And he wasn't the number one target. He wasn't even the number two or three target. Well, I think I can give you three million reasons why they let Lloyd go. But 70-something receptions? I know. He, you know, he... he it seemed like they were all in a few games. I, I don't know. But maybe I, he's looking for an end that can get down. Remember we talked about stretching the field. If you can stretch the field, there's more space for Brady to throw into. That's one thing that you get people don't understand. you got guys like Breeze. He's got great receivers that can get down the field. They're tall. They can really go after the football. Now you're stretching out the defense, so there's more space. Well, they got this guy Jones from Buffalo. You know, he, he looked, yeah, he got he 40 looked, receptions He last looked year. good against them, and he had... He had Ryan Fitzpatrick throwing to him. So maybe they're thinking, you know, I got this big guy with Brady throwing to him. That'll help. I don't know if, what their approach is. The other guy from Buffalo, Nelson, he, he was a guy who he wasn't was, bad. No, he wasn't bad at all. So, and, and not only that, if you get a player from your division rival, you strengthen yourself, yourself while weakening your opponents. But it comes down, it really comes down to, you know, I don't know if Bel Belichick's supposed to be a genius on defense, and he's not. Well, maybe the part of the problem is that the division has been we so weak that they don't really have to play good teams in the division. Maybe they have to play more good teams. I, you I know, know what else I heard, Ron, on, on defensive backs? Their best defensive backs come from other teams. Yeah. They don't develop defensive backs. Although they had Samuel and they had Law. Well, Dennard looked pretty good last year, but he's got, you know, he may be wearing an orange jumpsuit for a while. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. If, 
you know, hopefully he'll be back next year. But then you've got to worry about Vaughn leaving. Did he, I don't know what, what's happening with him. Well, Jake Long signed a, a huge contract, I think, four years, $36 million with, I think, the Rams. And, and you know, I, now he's had a better health history than Vollmer. And, you know, teams may not want to pay the biggest money for a guy who's really had a bad back and missed a lot of time. But you know what's going to be a key, too, for the Patriots this year? With you, is if Edelman stays healthy... Running back punts. Well, Edelman. If he's well, no, Edelman is still a free agent, so we don't know what. Yeah, I mean, if they, it looks like they're going to. Well, sign they have him Leon now. Washington now. Well, why they have Washington, Washington returning kickoffs. Well, he does punts too. Yeah, but he, his best, his asset is on kickoff return. Right. right? What was he averaging? Twenty-eight yards. Something return, like that. Yeah. And the Patriots averaged twenty-one. Yeah, that was a big difference. So that's going to that's a key too. You know, they'll have someone solid back there. Then they have that track. Guy, oh, Demps, yeah, he, Demps. you know, forget about him. He's he's off running he track. Do, he wants to do both, run track and play for the Patriots. But, well, you know, I want to see him sign Vollmer again. Well, we think they're probably going to trade Mallet, maybe try to get the third round choice back, and then, you they know. Castle, oh, Castle already signed. Yeah, I don't know who, who they've got, but this, you know, it doesn't really matter. If Brady gets hurt, things are bad. Yeah. Now, the Celtics, I don't know what you can say. They played a fantastic game against Miami, although they wilted down the stretch. You can't say it wasn't great down the stretch. And then last night against New Orleans, they absolutely Second you know, they threw up a fur ball. They, they played disinterested basketball. And uh, as we both talked about, you, uh, Davis tipped in the ball to, to win the game at the end, but the, the Celtics made no effort to get in his way. Well, he's got Ed standing there in green. It's got Ed's here, green's here. And he comes over here, Davis, to tip in the ball. I mean, yeah. it was a disa disaster. I don't know what Garnett was thinking about in green. And then green scored, I think, 13 points in the first half, got nothing in the second. But I don't know what Rivers, like we were talking, some people think that the Celts don't want to end up in fourth, f fifth or sixth place because they'll have uh, fifth place, fourth or fifth, they'll have to play Miami. So they want to skip Miami in that second round. It's they think they can beat anybody else. It's possible that the other argument could be made that the Celtics are so old that unless they're fresher, maybe they're not going to be able to beat anybody. Yeah, but and another thing, too, is I like Lee a lot. I think Lee's been playing real good basketball, but he's not. He, Rivers doesn't keep him in there long enough. He could be playing good basketball, and then he takes him out, puts either Terry in or um, Crawford in. Right. You know, we went to the game against Toronto last week, and it, it was really kind of disjointed the, the way they played. They, they, Toronto just didn't show up that game. But it wasn't like the Celtics were playing that great. Garnett kind of struggled early. Pierce had a pretty good game. Um, but do you think Green should be starting now? I had a Bass. Well, Bass gives him more rebound and a little tougher down low, but I would start Green because it's going to be a mismatch for the team they're playing against. Yeah, he's 6'9". He's, he's actually taller than Bass. Yeah, the, the, everybody who saw Miami... Uh, saw Green have a career game with 43 points. He was making threes. He was taking the ball to the hoop like a madman. I mean, obviously he showed a really tremendous skill set. You know, if he played like that every game, he'd be Durant. If the Celtics could play like that, they were moving the ball well. They were kicking it. The, the Miami was having a tough time staying with them. Miami's the best defensive team in basketball. You know, and they, were having, they were having a tough time. Yeah, I was trying to watch Miami's defense closely and try to understand exactly what they were doing. At times it looks like they're playing a 1-2-2 two, two zone, but, you know, they trap all the time. And, you know... Well, Pierce did a good job of finding um, Green a lot for those yeah, three the, points. Yeah, the only problem for Pierce is he turned the ball over too much. He had seven turnovers. He's not thinking right. It's not... It's, it's, his, it's his mental approach. He's making stupid turnovers. I mean, turnovers where he's getting the ball, he's throwing it over here, and there's a guy standing there on defense, and it, it's just... It's weird what's happening. It's not that he's under big time pressure. Like Allen, now Allen has a tough time against pressure passing the ball. Right. Pierce is just, he's not concentrating. Well, it, you know, um, I think they, they miss having, you know, a really solid backup point guard. You know, they, I mean, a t in the substitute role, you know, Terry is not a point guard. You know, he, he when he's shooting well, it's great, but, you know, other times he's out there and, it, the flow gets all broken down. You know, you, I mean, the second, if, if Green is going to be in the second group, you've got to get the ball to Green a lot. And let him take the ball. He's mm -hmm. going to get fouled or whatever. 
How about that other team that had a good year this year? Yeah, our, <laughs> they had their last tournament this weekend. Yeah, our our, our youth players who uh, you know we're, we're look. I'm look really looking forward not only to this weekend's tournament but to the breakup session where we talk about individual players, and I, I think that'll give a a, us a chance to communicate what really needs to be done in the future to bring the girls program back to uh, more success. Right, there's a good freshman class, you know, this year's freshman class is a good class. I, I know they're really committed. They work extremely hard. They have in the, in the last couple of years that I've watched them and they've improved a lot. You know this class here going up is gonna be real strong. The key is, you know, they've gotta keep that progression going. You know, with that last group we had, you know, I mean, well, some I, of the players kept it going and it seemed like well, I think th they lost a lot of that, uh, uh, you know, intensity. It, it's not what you teach, it's what you emphasize and what the players can ultimately learn. You know, that if there were any points to be made is that first, you have to keep the ball out of the lane, which means denying dribble penetration, denying post entry, and deny, denying weak side cuts. So if you can't do that, you can't play, you know. And it, I've been a basketball parent. I, you know, I know the frustration that goes along with it, but you have to do those things. You have to make a commitment to play hard on every possession. And standing there like a dime store Indian playing post defense is not defense. You, you're, just, you're just out there. And if that's how you want to play basketball, you can't play for me anyway. Yeah, you have to be accountable to the team and the coaches. And if, they, if the player's not doing a job, you've got to let them know that. And, you know, you just hope. You want a player really enjoying what they're doing. You know, you know, you want them to be able to compete against anybody. That's what our philosophy has always been. Right, and and ultimately the fun comes from playing hard. Uh, and again, in Billis's book, he talks about they're playing uh, North Carolina in an incredibly close game, and you know, there's a the huddle right at the end of the game, and Shashevsky looks up and Billis is waiting him for the scream, and he says, "Isn't this fun?" You know, and that's really how it should be. The, the competition, the, you know, what I call it is be selfish as a team. You know, be selfish for the team. Do what you have to do to be successful as a team. And if, if you do that, you're going to enjoy the, the game so much more. Right. Like these girls, let's face it, they're as talented as any team in the North that we've seen. You know, except Bill Rick is just a powerhouse. And they've closed the gap. Ten points isn't bad playing a team like Bill Rickle who wants to beat you by 50 every game. You know, in the second loss, we were down by eight at one time in the fourth period. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're just far superior than most teams, but it, the gap's closed. But every other team, you look at every other team, the next best team is Peabody. And, you know, we played that game against Peabody. That was a hard-fought game. And it all, to me, it comes down to up here. Well, it's, it's, you know, Can you handle the pressure? Bob Knight says it's, it's four to one mental to physical and you in a competitive basketball game you've got to be able to apply pressure and you've got to be able to withstand pressure and you know, another coach says pressure means you don't know what to do but you know what you hope Ron you really hope you see what these girls have been through in the last four years you really hope that they have coaching that really pushes them I mean I don't want to see them baby these players. If you, start ba if you start babying them, don't get on them if you don't see them really into it. I mean, this, these girls want to be coached. They don't want, they don't want a coach sitting there, not saying anything, not teaching, maybe oh. going over plays all practice. Well, you know, there's, there's certain things. It's about putting players in a position to succeed. If you're going to pick and roll, if you have a right-handed dribbler, you want them to be able to turn the corner with their right hand. If you have lefties, have them turn the corner with their left hand, going, starting from the right of the court and going to the middle. If you don't do that, you're not prepared as a coach to put the players in the, the right position to succeed. And those are the things you, you really have to think about day after day. But I see, I see what's coming up in the, in down in the fifth and sixth grade, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, to um, seventh grade. Well, next year's eighth grade team's a little light, but there's some good players, but there's not many players playing. But every other class is is strong. I mean, from this year's freshman class to all the way down to the fourth grade class, there's a lot of talent, and you hope they keep developing when they go up to high school and they keep improving, and the coaches take it serious enough, you know, to work with the girls all the way through. 
And, you know, the, I think girls basketball is coming back. The, the next year senior class and junior class, it's not that they don't have as many players playing. There's some talent there, and you hope to just keep developing. Well, thanks for joining us. I'm Ron Sen. And I'm Ralph LaBella, and thank you for watching Let's Talk Sports.